I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to tonight's College of Complexes. I just want to remind everybody about the great rules consisting of the college. First off, there is a $3 tuition, which uh, Charlie's collecting. Our uh, normal treasurer, Andy Anderson, will be coming a little bit later on. The college consists of the following format. We first have a brief announcements period, and our speaker will speak for a little while. Then there'll be a question period, and we again request that you don't make a statement during the question period, but ask a question. And then after the question period's over, you'll each get a chance to rebut. Usually it's about a four-minute statement. And after that, the speaker will get the last word. I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Pat White, author of the newly released Buzz Ride, <coughs> Driven to Disruption, Memoirs of an Uber Driver. A finance guy begins driving Uber on a dark weekends one summer in Chicago's nightclub neighborhoods to get a better understand the gig economy and finds himself both fascinated and repulsed by what he discovers. A darkly comic coming of middle age adventure. Moving from corporate boardrooms to city streets become, became an unexpected adventure when a business consult, consultant spends three months operating a rideshare car in Chicago. Author Pat White drove for more than 600 people in his Mercedes in the spring and summer, experiencing the, ex, ah, experiencing the every aspect of humanity. Buzz Wright showcases the nocturnal journeys he made to spectacular, I'm sorry, to spectacular homes and dive bars driving neighborhoods of Wicker Park and Humboldt Park to the Gold Coast and everything in between. Let us give a rousing round of applause tonight for our speaker. Thank you very much. I'd also like to uh, mention your publisher too. Yes, please, please. Um, it's kind of neat, my publisher, it's called Lake Claremont Press. It's a small Chicago publishing house that only does books that pertain to Chicago. And it's run by a young woman who grew up at Western and Irving Park and became very successful, Sharon Woodhouse. And Sharon set this up, and I'm really excited about this. I didn't know what to expect. I'll, I'll be really honest. I, all I knew was what I was able to read and, and, and the like, and I've been, uh, the guys have filled me in a little bit. We have people from various spectrums of, of politics from progressive to conservative, all points in between, east, west, north, south. And my assistant is my sister Maria. And I said to her, this is what's missing in this country right now. The ability for people with different points of view to amicably get into a room, maybe kid about them, discuss them, and try and see the other person's point of view, we have gotten miles from that with the younger generation and with the so-called leaders in Washington. So I'm very excited to be here. The winter of 2013, I'm driving with a friend. A car goes by with a hideous pink mustache on the front. So I said to her, what is that? Some kind of statement of support for lip cancer? I'm seeing these cars with pink mustaches. She says, no, you old fool. That's a rideshare car. I said, well, now remember, it's 2013. I said, what the hell is a rideshare car? She said, it's where people can go out and give people rides in their own cars and get paid for it, and it's driven by an application. I said, you're crazy. She goes, no, it's the new disruptive sharing economy. So I said, what are you smoking? Share it with me. It made no sense. So I went home and I started to research it. And I was fascinated. I spent the early part of my career in the investment industry. Then I went into higher education. And then I spent some time in corporate America. And when I was in higher education, Occasionally, I would get published in a, book, in a business journal here or there. And I knew it was a while, so I wanted to get something in a journal again and be relevant. So this idea hit me. This new giga sharing economy. And the way that the young people are transferring commerce through a smartphone. 
So I said, boy, there, there's a paper right there. How am I going to research this paper? I thought about it. Then it hit me. Why don't I drive Uber for 90 days on the weekends, and every young person would come in, I'd ask them a series of questions. How many e-commerce apps are on your smartphone? What dollar amount are you comfortable with? Do you bank on your smartphone? So after the second night of coming home and punching in the data, I would start to laugh about what was going on in the car. The discussions I was having. The things I was seeing. Some of them humorous. Some of them disgusting. Some of them heartwarming, some of them out and out, terrified. So after the second night, I said, hey, let Mackenzie write this report. There's a book going on in the backseat of my car. And that's when Buzz Ride was born. I got the name because when you are signaled to a, uh, a fair, the uh, iPhone that Uber gives you buzzes. And that was also the condition of 80% of the people who got in the car <laughs> extremely buzzed. Yeah. So I spent 90 days doing this. The first couple of weeks were exciting, made me, was kind of youthful, felt like this urban warrior. And I go by Pat, but Uber had me as Patrick, so the, the riders were calling me Patrick, and I'll, that'll be significant in a little bit. Well. After about five or six weeks, a hardened edge in me started to come out. An untrusting edge, a disgusted edge, with what I was watching on Friday and Saturday nights. The lack of honesty and frankness, the disrespect for their fellow men, the ability not to have a conversation where you didn't agree with somebody. I once had a group of young girls get in the car and ask me my opinion on gay marriage. And I started out by saying that I was happy that the civil union has been passed. And before I could go into my next sentence, which was, I haven't researched this topic enough at a red light, they all got out of my car, slammed the doors, and called me a bunch of names. Because in their mind, I'm this old guy over 50, I'm not cool, I don't understand gay people. No, I just sat at the table in the 80s with seven gay clients and watched half of them die. And planned what was left over for their nieces and nephews with their investment. Because there was this new disease that nobody knew about. How dare you make that assumption? But we don't talk anymore. We don't get in a room like this and tease and exchange ideas and thoughts and philosophies. You're either way over here or you're way over here. You're wrong, you're this, you're that. And boy, that came out in that car. Also, the disrespect for mankind, the lack of respect we have for human life. Society has really, really migrated to a point that when you get back into it, and I didn't grow up with any kind of wealth. I came from a very financially challenged household. I did every menial job I could from eighth grade through college. And I was, I was proud of every job I did. And here I was 30 years later putting myself back in that role and realizing the amount of disrespect that grew from people to people who were providing a service to them. It was quite enlightening. Funny stories? Yes. Having young ladies ask you questions about what? sexual choices and having them singing songs from the 70s with you to great <coughs> jokes, a lot of that. A lot of sadness too, watching a man bleed out of his skull in the middle of Madison Street, two miles west of the United Center at 1.30 in the morning. Boy, it looks different on WGN News, as opposed to sitting there and watching it. It was scary. It was real scary. I grew up in this city. I love this city. But we always tend to travel the same routes and go to the same neighborhoods. 
but landing in new neighborhoods and saying, wow, I do not know where I'm at, and I don't like this. But also discovering beautiful new neighborhoods that I never knew were there. It was the random distribution of mankind, a lot of outliners. I faced a lot of clenched fists. I faced a lot of disrespect. But here's what I see is happening to our generation. And I see it more now post the book. And I live in the area, I live a mile from here. When I'm sitting at a red light, I will count the number of rideshare cars. There's many, many rideshare cars out there. If you see the Lyft emblem, the Uber emblem, the airport emblem, you can go to a red light and 60% of the cars can be rideshare. And then I look at some of the cars. Audi A7s, BMWs. You don't buy a car like that to do this because the maintenance schedule is heavy. And I say to myself, there's a shift going on in our labor force. People are being underemployed, they're out of work, and they're moving to this. Now, everybody says, well, you know, this is a pretty efficient thing that's going on in the economy. We're going to have no wasted assets. You have a spare bedroom, Airbnb says, rent out your bedroom. You're not doing anything, you have a car, go drive people around. Not a bad idea unless you bought a cab medallion for $400,000. And those guys are taking it right in the nose. But I sat back and looked at this. And I really hate to say this because it's me. I would venture to say that people over the age of about 45 through the age of 70 who want to contribute to the workforce, we are becoming no different than the horse was when the automobile was invented. If we don't have a strong technological acumen, we're sunk. Middle management jobs are going. More work is being done by less people. And I thought about this. Within two years, the autonomous car will be on these streets. It's already in Cleveland. Who are we kidding? What happens to these people who have found themselves driving strangers at night to augment their income when Uber or Lyft gets into an agreement with General Motors or Toyota? They merge forces, they merge databases, they merge technologies, and now the individual is out of it, and this pre programmed automobile can go. 24-7 without going to the john, without taking a nap, and probably less likely to get into an accident than all of us. Where do those people then get shifted to? They're hanging on as it is. I saw a study yesterday that over the next few years, 800 million jobs will be replaced globally by robots. Robot is a term that makes us think of the 1950s movie, but if you look at robotics on an assembly line and what they're doing, it's very efficient. It's either, they're driven by microprocessors. They don't need a sick day. They don't have to rush home if the, the daycare center closed. But where do the people go to work? It is shrinking. It is scary. And that became evident. That and the fact that most of us were part of the Woodstock generation, going back, we came of age in the 60s and 70s, right? Hot, no, I'm sorry. Hey, hot tip. You know what I found out in the front seat of that car? We're irrelevant, man. <laughs> that was, where did those 30 years go? We were the cool young rebels. And now they look at us like we looked at our parents. <laughs> that, that was really, really an uncomfortable feeling. And 
I tried to put myself in the position of these young kids in the time. A lot of them were almost hostile. Kind of viewed us as we were byproducts of the greatest generation who handed us a pretty good economy. And they look at it like we took it and messed it up. A few of them said that. Look at the debt you're handing us. Look at the condition of the world. Way to go. Oh, hey, I didn't do it. It just, it just got up, went to work. But that's kind of a perspective they have on this. But then I looked at them and I said, you know what? When I was in my early 20s, I was angry because we had this conflict called Vietnam. And I looked at my parents and I didn't think this was right. I didn't think that was right. And I said, boy, you guys really messed things up. I don't know if that is more of a perspective of age, theirs and mine, and my, where in 30 years, after maybe experiencing more of life, they will be a bit more hardened and maybe a tad more, I don't want to use the term practical, but maybe a little bit more wisdom, I don't know. But then some of them I felt sorry for them too. The kids who basically would get in the car and tell you that they were going to work because, you know, because they got a degree in something they can't use and they have student loan debt that they're buried in. Your heart goes out for them. It really does. It really does. But at the end of the day, I looked at them and said, they're not different. They're us. 30 years later. But they're supercharged. They got this little three by five inch blade in their hand. They bank on it, order pizzas on it, get their car on it, have sex on it. <coughs> they do it all on this phone. And think about what this phone does. I remember in college, if I wanted to have music, you had speakers the size of coffee tables, six components, you couldn't put it all in a car. They pull out a set of earbuds, they got 6,000 phones, 6,000 songs in here. And we used to walk around with these big Panifex things that had calendars and our contacts that we'd write in. Hey man, it's right here. The world is right here. You can learn how to do anything right here if you know how to navigate a search engine. As my two, I have twin 25 year old sons. When I wanted to know how to do something, they just look at me and go, go to YouTube, Google it, it's there. And they're right. But deep down, these are kids coming of age in a scary world, looking at us as old people, even though in our mind's eye, maybe we don't want to look at us as such. And then you come home and you say to yourself, wow, the greatest generation, they're going by pretty fast. God, in the last few months, we lost Jerry Lewis, Dick Gregory. So that means that the baby boomers are moving into the on-deck circle. I don't want to be in the on-deck circle. There's not a darn thing I can do about it, but I don't want to be. And now my generation's starting to die. Glenn Fry and Tom Petty and all these guys, they're starting to go. So from the seat of this car, I got a perspective on A, a little bit of my mortality and the fact that the last 30 years went by pretty fast. I'm no longer cool or relevant. But B, the world is changing in dog years. It really, really is. And the one thing I looked at, if you go back to the previous century, we got electricity and we got radio. And we got television. Radio and television, except for improvements in more stations, and, you know, quality and picture and this and that, basically was the same technology for what? From, like, the 40s through today. The telephone with the, I'm talking the landline, pretty much the same technology. Radio, the same technology. All of a sudden, we hit the early 80s. And look at the advancements that we have seen. And every new advancement 
propels the next advancement quickly. That things are moving so fast that I started to think I lost my dad in 1989. And the big thing in 89 was the thermal fax machine. Look at what's happened to everything we do. And it's all coming to roost. One more comment I want to make, which is really pretty fascinating because a couple of topics touched on corporate the you know the, the corporate bankers and the way they work. I spent 20 years in that business. You know a little bit about valuations of companies. In the old days, you'd value an AT&T. AT&T had big offices. They had switchboards. They owned real estate. They had crews to go out and work on the lines. They had substations. They had assets. Let's take a look at Uber. <coughs> Uber's an application and as we, with a database with a handful of people that try and run it. And the key word there, if you've been watching the news, is they try and run it. Their corporate governance has been pretty bad. But when you strip it down, the assets of the corporation are what? Cars owned by independent contractors that can quit on you any given day. So how are we valuing something that is an application with a bunch of leases and a handful of employees at $7 billion? <coughs> Oh, it's future earnings. BS. <clears throat> We've gotten to the point where we'd rather buy hype than substance. Now, if they merge with Toyota and there's a fleet of a half a million cars around the world that, that are functioning on their own and they're owned by a hybrid company of Uber and Toyota or Uber and GM, now you have assets. But you know what you got to do to get those assets? You got to go borrow money. Now your cash flow doesn't look good because you're going to service the debt. But right now, the way it is structured, with no assets, and maybe this sums up where we're at globally. Seven billion dollars, really? So this is the changing gig, gig economy. The um, New York Times did an article a month. A month after the book came out, they cited my book and two other books that um, talk about the gig economy and what people are doing to survive. It is a fascinating time, but it's also a very scary time. I want to thank you for having me. Um, the book's $12.95. We have a few here. Um, it's uh, really more of a read about the social mores and the change, the generational shift that's going on right now. So now do I open it up for questions? Yes. All right. All right. Maybe you want to moderate? Okay. Just go ahead and point out somebody and come on, guys. We got questions. Go after it. First one. Um, are you familiar with the work of Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist? And I've his, read, read some of his stuff, but if you have something particular... Um, you know, and there, there's, there's... Are you familiar also with the economist... Uh, I, his name's escaping my mind right now. But generally, what are your predictions for the economy and the, specifically the U.S. over the next maybe 10 or 15 years? Okay. I, I wouldn't go... I, I have a hard enough time going out two years, let alone okay. 10 or 15 years, the way things are moving. I think that we are in a very precarious, precarious spot with we are training a lot of people for jobs that are evaporating before they're out of school, number one. Number two, we have a group of people who have a lot of work left in, the, in them. You know, el you know, people north of like 45 through 70 that I talked about 
<coughs> that are finding it harder and harder to find places to apply their skill set. I see more work getting done by a lot less, which we all do. And I have to laugh when I see an unemployment number of 4.1%. And I think it's a under unemployment number of 4.1%. Because how many of these people are gainfully employed in one spot the way they, they were maybe 15 years ago? How many of these people are maybe not being utilized to the full capacity of their education or background? So I look at that number and I'm aghast every month. And when people get up and brag about it, quite honestly, I want to throw something at the television. But going down the road, I think we may be headed to a point where we have this band of extremely wealthy. They own certain corporations, they own application companies, but they still need people to get revenue to buy their application or to bank with them or to do whatever. So they're willing to take a little bit more of a tax bite if the government funnels the money back through to like a minimum wage allowance to those who can't find work. Almost like what's going on in Finland in a way. And I can see that almost evolving. The other interesting thing, and this is not, this is very scary and disgusting to say, and I, and I was talking to a prominent businessman, he said, you know what? This planet is trying to serve too many people. And we haven't had a major multi-continent conflict since World War II. And he said, you can feel this planet getting crowded and the resources getting pushed, which is a real interesting observation. I found that quite fascinating. So what do I see happening? I see that gap getting wider. And, you know, if you study history when the gap gets too wide, crazy things happen. Yes, sir. I have uh, two hard questions. Good. Okay, first of all, I'm a big biker, walker, <coughs> transit fan, <coughs> transit user, and I don't like Uber. It's more pollution, it's more cars on the road, it's more dangerous drivers. They have creepy people. Yeah. Uber cuts corners. They have, they, 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 you know, they don't have the controls and the safety. So, one answer to that, that was my first question. And my um, second question is, has to be uh, with the uh, Trump bump, with the uh, Dow Jones, uh, the, um, you know, the uh, bubble stock market. Um, you know, I think it, it, what's going on is that that's, that's, the, that's the 1% value. And um, and uh, it's not a judge of the economy at all, and, but but it's everybody knows about it, and I think it's a farce that people think that's a judge of the economy. So that's it. The Dow Jones question, and then the Uber cutting corners question. First, let, first let me talk about Uber. I mean, it's coming out that <laughs> as corporate governors, they are terrible. You know, they had their sexual harassment problems months ago. They buried a um, data breach by paying off the hackers. By the way, I did get my notification that I was, they have my birthday, social security number, and, and all those other good things. Um, I think it's, I th I'm not a fan of ride share. I'm really tired of a guy pulling over in my lane, putting his flashers on, and thinking that I want to wait until whomever comes down to the apartment and gets in the car. And they're blocking traffic. Or they decide to pull a U-turn in front of me. Because, hey, they're out working, man. Okay, sure. And they're bad for CTA. And they're, you know what? CTA. There's, nobody's a fan of a cab driver, right? But I, my heart goes out for these guys. And I'll tell you why. My whole life, whether it was sunny out, or it was rainy out, or if it was below zero, if I walked out and I went like this, some guy pulled up. And he paid for that franchise. He financed his house, and he spent up to $400,000 
for that city hall manipulated medallion that sits on his hood. And you know what medallions are worth today? Thirty to forty thousand dollars. Cab drivers are losing their homes. Cab drivers used to use it like a line of credit. Pay it down. Joe's going to college. Borrow from it. Pay it down. No. And there's another interesting situation buried beneath that. The major thrift in New York that financed cab driver medallions two months ago filed for bankruptcy because its loan portfolio went down. The asset was worth a lot less than what was owed. Is that why it was so expensive? It was like there was a market. Well, they, they, there was they controlled the number that could get out. and then people did right. Drove up the price. Now I don't want to get political here. But does anybody this know? Is yeah, I don't want to get political. I really don't want to get political here. Well, does anybody know whose brother owns half of a good hunk of Uber? Mayor Emanuel. Emanuel. Ram Emanuel. No, really? Ari Emanuel out in L.A. was one of the first investors in Uber. <laughs> so now you know why Uber gets pretty much carte blanche in this city. Yeah, we should kick them out like London. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Wall Street. Daily owns the meters. No. Let's talk about Wall Street. All right. Yeah. This. The bubble. And let me tell you something. I, I grew up in the business and. I respect the times when markets would go up and down and it took an element of thought and analysis instead of just getting up and saying, where am I going to throw my dart today? The first problem we have is money has nowhere else to go. You can't go and buy a bond and get five or six or ten percent. Real estate maybe but it's illiquid so they're funneling market in there they're funneling money in the market by these incredibly low interest rates which is another situation that amazes me because the rest of the world is still easing and we're getting ready to tighten and we're out of sync it doesn't make much sense to me because that forces your dollar up here and it, it kind of messes up trade, but that's going to get messed up another way. But anyway, the market right now is trading box, at 20, now, total average, 25 times earnings. They're getting goodies on the table, friends. 25 times earnings. It used to be that 12 to 15 times earnings was nosebleed. What is it? 25 times earnings as a prior. It used to be what? 12 to 15. Not two, and I'm not talking 10 years ago. I'm talking two or three years ago. It's a bubble. Oh. It's a bubble, but it's a self-fulfilling bubble. Some of the things you look at is, you know, in the industry you look at a lot of moving averages. <coughs> and the key ones are your Basically, you look at a 200-day moving average, and just to make it easy, if you go along like this, this is normal. But when your moving average is up here, and your index is here, that is scary, because at some point, this is going to revert to the mean, and your bubble pops. It's called mean reversion. I look at this market, and it scares the daylights out of me. I also know there's nowhere else to put money. I also know that people are buying. There are less government restrictions. Money's going to be continue to be loose. We're going to get a tax modification. Right? And they're already baking this in the cake on forward earnings. And that's where we're at today. What's going to pop the bubble? More, big more? I don't know what's going to pop call. Look, if this guy keeps lighting candles in Korea and the market keeps going, doo, 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 doo. we don't care. I said to a buddy of mine I used to work with in the industry, what does the missile have to hit Japan for the market to get concerned? 
20 years ago, if somebody shot off a missile in the middle of trading hours, you would see a red line down. Now you just do, do, do. Yeah, don't worry about it. We got that under control. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. There's a, a lot of Chicago cab drivers won't go on the west and the south side. How about you? Wow. Good question. Back when I was driving, again, 2013 and 14 doesn't seem like a long time ago, but in the world of ride share, it was the early days. So the applications weren't that sophisticated. And I would pick up a, a fare and not know where I was going. And, you know, I heard the story in the book. It was late on a hot Saturday night. I get called to a beautiful downtown hotel. So I figured it was going to be the glitzy couple who wanted to go home. They were out to dinner. And out walks this young man in, in uh, kitchen clothes. And he knocks on my window and he says, sir, you can't drive me home in this car. I said, what? He said, you can't drive me home. I said, well, I have an implied contract. I hit, I hit accept, so I have to drive you. He goes, no, I'll get somebody else. You're not going in my neighborhood. I said, no, we're going home. There's a young kid putting himself through school, and he cuts vegetables in the banquet kitchen. 12-hour shift. Started out to be one of the greatest rides I ever had. We were talking business, sharing ideas. You could see the excitement in his eyes about what he was studying, and, and, and his inquisition was beautiful. And we're driving down Madison Street. Go by the UC, keep going, go about two miles. I see blue lights everywhere. It's two in the morning. We pull up, I look. There's five Chicago cops around it. There's a guy laying in the middle of Madison Street with blood coming out of his skull. There's a crowd 20 to 30 deep at 2 in the morning. Little kids, adults, all craning. Little boy, little boy running around, 10 years old, 2 in the morning. He's looking at the ambulance like it's the good humor truck. And I was in shock. So I drove another half a mile, took a right, dropped him off, and he said to me, he goes, Sir, how you getting home? I looked at him and I said, fast, fast, Terrence, <laughs> real fast. <laughs> Had to go back the way I came. Came back and the carnage was still going on. I was like having an outer body experience. And to me, to me, what was it? Four or five miles from the Magnificent Mile? Three, four miles from the University of Chicago, Hyde Park? Yeah, you're going to hear about it tonight on WGN. But it's different to see it. To see those wide eyes laying up at you. To see the bag getting ready. I went from just the coolest discussion with a great young man to the hard reality of what we went Man, that was a really profound moment in my life. And that's a chapter of the book. So I wound up going anyway, to be honest. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you look at economic history, there have been disruptions all the way through. Mm -hmm. So why isn't what's going on now just another stage of economic development as a disruption? Because I think we've evolved as a society that the people getting disrupted now have become comfortable to a lifestyle. Whereas, if I was, if I was picking cotton by hand, and the cotton gin came out, mm -hmm. what was I used to? A very low level of existence. I mean, okay, it, it's funny because I recently reread the Great Saran, and the farmers out in California, as they were losing their farms, referred to this new thing, the tractor, 
as the machine. And the only one who could afford the machine was the big banks that were repossessing my farms. And this machine allowed them to, to farm 20 times the amount of farms as 300 people would take 300 people. One machine and one man. And that analogy hit me of how efficient we're becoming. But back then, we were display, displacing more. Small farmers and migrant workers. Now we're displacing middle managers. We're displacing people who basically ran divisions. And, and it's trickling down. And in their mind's eye, their life was a lot different than the small farmer in the late 20s or the migrant worker who would, would tend the field. So the difference, I think, is how we've elevated ourselves. And through that great post-war expansion, as an economy, we came up, people don't like to go down. So I, that's the difference. Yes, sir? Yeah, Pat, there's a certain amount written about how the independent contractors of these services are exploited and you had disparaging remarks about uber management to management but aren't the wall street traders and the banking establishment equally culpable for this exploitation yes absolutely but you know what they're in the job of exploitation oh. <laughs> they don't hide it that is an they don't hide it Oh, they don't hide it. You got a situation, you want money raised, it's going to cost you X. Hey, bankers haven't changed since the time of Christ. <laughs> maybe, maybe before. Before. They're opportunistic. You want it done, here's the price. You don't want to get it done, don't pay it. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we had a good mayor who's have training and experience as a taxi driver. Do you see the same thing happening with Uber? Um, no. I don't. I see Uber becoming a fully automated company, and I I see General Motors becoming and Toyota and all of them becoming as much software companies as they are automobile companies. Seriously, and if you ask me today, and I'll take this to another industry, what are Wells Fargo, Chase, Citibank, and Bank of America? You're going to say banks, right? They're software companies. They spend more money in R&D and software than any other line item, from, from security through operational enhancement. The commercial lending officer, as we know him, 12 to 18 months, he's behind an Uber. Because there's going to be no need. The algorithms can do it better, can do it cheaper, can do it, qu oh yeah, better, cheaper, quicker. Yeah. They don't have to take Joe Smith out of lunch. Right? They don't go to the country club. No, what's going to happen is Joe Smith, his CFO is going to put all the data in, tax returns, financial, seasonality. They're going to type in the type of loan they want. And instead of two or three meetings and an analyst spreading the deal at the bank, the guy's going to hit send, and in 20 seconds he's going to know. It's called FinTech. FinTech is a rolling monster that's getting ready to... It, 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 it's already happening in the investment industry. Quick and loans, does it? That's the small end, you're right. Quicken Loans, the mortgage is online, but now it's going to go up to the <coughs> small and mid-sized business level. I need an inventory loan, I need a receivables loan, I want to expand my company. It's going to all be done online. If you look at the structure of the branch banking system right now, walk into a chase. Look at the way it's constructed. There. It's constructed that you could tear it down in a weekend. Everything is temporary. 
you're going to walk in to a room full of machines and maybe one customer service person. We all remember the old days of the bank. Remember the old days of the bank? You'd walk in, you go see your banker, and outside of his office, I don't mean to sound sexist, but this is the way it was, there'd be about six women in front of typewriters clacking away. They were doing loan applications. And you'd walk in and you'd see them, there'd be a whole teller line, and then there'd be the bigger offices, right? You know what those people had that we don't have at banks today? It's called a pen. And a pen to a banker is the authorization to lend money on the spot. A small banker may have a pen for $2,000, meaning if a guy comes in and says, you know, my, my business account, I've been here 20 years, it's going to be overdrawn because the client didn't pay me. The guy can say, don't worry about it. His pen was 2000 The guy in the bigger office had a 10000 pen, and all the way down to the president, who maybe had 100000 pen. Walk into a Chase or Wells or Bank of America or City Branch. There isn't one person with even $2,000 worth of authority in that bank. They got to get on the phone and call about 15 layers. And at that point, you don't care anymore. <clears throat> yes, sir. So how are you preparing your 25-year-old for this nefarious future that you're describing? Wonderful question. <laughs> because it is affecting my house. I have one who wants to get into finance. He has a degree in finance. He's on the East Coast. And I told him point blank, A, you better do something because you go off my health insurance at 26. B, the best thing that you can do is go look at programs like Python, and learn how to program. Not that you will ever program, because there are going to need, need some people to be between the machines and the customers, but you will be able to communicate with those who can. My other son is artistically gifted, as well as um, uh, he's a, he loves the Constitution, and he's a brilliant kid, he's going to go study constitutional law. So that's, and I just keep my fingers crossed, to be honest with you. So, thanks, good question, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Is, um, it seems to me that running an automobile is very expensive. Um, what's, uh, what would a, an average person hope to actually net from it? And is Uber kind of use their deal as sort of a carrot where they tell people the gross but not really tell them what the net is and are there people who might be vulnerable to signing up for Uber and it's actually a losing proposition? It's a fantastic question. I'm glad you asked it. Because I would sit there and I have an MBA so I've had my share of cost account, right? And I'd sit at a red light and I'd look at another Uber driver. And I'd say, that guy doesn't get it. He's going to go home tonight. He's going to divide the number of hours. Maybe he'll subtract his gas, right? But when you start breaking down wear and tear, insurance, depreciation, everything else. And back then, there weren't a lot of them. There weren't. Now they're everywhere. They're lucky if they're making eight bucks an hour. They're making minimum wage. And let me tell you, it's a hard way to make minimum wage. Does that answer your question? Well, and, and is, are there people who, uh, certain types of people where if they sign up for Uber, it might actually, they might end up worse off? Sure, you're going to end up with a car that has no value ahead of its time, right? And you can't, you know, you got to replenish that. This gentleman is, you're in Africa, this gentleman here. Okay, uh, you had mentioned that thing about the four ladies that jumped out of your car. Uh, uh, do the 
I know when people give you, they rate you or they yes. rate you or whatever. Does that affect the uh, the amount of pay you get in any way? Uh, no, it, it can affect if they keep you. Um, the rating system was five, and I only had two people rate me below a five. She was one, and another one was a, a funny young man. Um, early on, I picked him up, and this guy gets out. He's got khaki pants on, plaid shirt, kind of looked out of place for where he was. And he's in his mid-twenties and he says, what, does your Mercedes need gas? I don't say anything. And then he says to me, you know, my generation's going to define your generation's future. So I hit the lock button and I said, you know what, Clown? Why don't I define the next two hours of your future? I'm going to drop you off at 52nd State and see how the hell you do. He gave me a little rating. Yes, sir. In all your travels talking to people, did you ever run across anybody that compared being an Uber driver to uh, building a business as an Amway distributor? And, and my second part of the question is, did you ever think about that? What's the difference between building an Uber business and trying to build an Amway business? The only difference is, you don't have to fill up the trunk of your car with Uber's products. <laughs> but you're right. It's very much pyramid-esque. Very much. And, and there's more things going on like this. The expansion of the independent contractor and the exploitation of it by companies is what's going on is in, a lot of insurance companies are known for this right now um, especially in the supplemental benefits area where you got an insurance license you're on your own but you know what you gotta buy this you gotta do this you gotta go here you gotta go there and next thing you know you're in the hole for two grand before you've done anything and of the two grand, 1500 is being written to them. So who are they making their money out? Yes, ma'am. Were you warned of the fact that as an independent contractor that you had to Thank pay you. Social Security and Medicare? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because my brother was working for one of the tax services, also as a financial uh, CPA. Got a guy who working for Uber, lose the money, and though he had to come up with some yes. pretty hard cash. Right. When you when you file your taxes, you've got to come up with your Medicare tax. You got to come up. Yeah, you got to come up with all. Of it. Yes, sir. Uh, these people that drive for Uber, uh, would they ever tell their auto insurance companies that they're using their car for a commercial enterprise? Oh boy, that's that's the big gray area. That's the big gray area because if you look at most personal and car insurance policy. <laughs> there is a line there, not for commercial use. That's that's one that's been argued back and forth. And the one thing you don't want to have happen, and thank God it didn't happen, was get into an accident with somebody in the car. Because this variant the various ways the blame can go, and usually the ride share company steps back and goes, Yeah, that's that's one that gets argued quite a bit. Yes, sir. The, the Obama administration was importing poverty for eight years, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> especially with chain migration. Now, Trump wants to stop that. He wants to have uh, Im immigrants based on education and skills. What do you think about that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. You know what? Here's the deal. Build a wall. I am the grandchild of immigrants. I am too. And they came here and there was a process. And they went through it. Yes, a lot of people have come here and they're here. And there, there's a lot of good people here. But we need to get a process to identify who's here. If you're here, you're going to become one of us. And we'll, we have to find a way to do that. But we also deserve the right to know who and what is coming here. And I don't know how they solved this problem. But what just happened in San Francisco was a disgusting travesty. 
usually don't do it. I don't know how to solve it. I don't like typecasting people in one big basket, which is another Washington trick. You know, if you get one bad apple, the whole barrel is bad. Yes, people are coming here for the same reason my grandfathers came here, for a better life. But you know what? If you really want that better life, it comes with a price and a system. And yes, it takes a while. I understand that. We've got to find a way to get our hands around knowing who and what is coming here. If you're going to come here and, and contribute, well, you're going to sign up for the whole kit and caboodle. Taxes, military service, the whole thing, man. This isn't a one, you know, this isn't a come on in and see what you like. And don't. It isn't a cafeteria where, you know what, I'll take this, but I don't want that. I'll sign up, you know what, I'll go have a baby and you guys can pay for it. But I'm not going to let you know I'm here. No, you're either all in or you're all out. And it's up to us to figure out a way to solve this problem. Yet, a lot of these people are doing jobs supposedly, I don't know if that's the case, that a lot of they say Americans won't. And I'd like to test that theory a little bit. Because as people get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier, they find a job they'll do. Yes, sir. Why is it companies can move from one country to another anytime they damn feel like it, regardless of what happens to the employees who built the corporation? And is it really illegal to want to provide for your own? Well, companies are... Uh, George? Companies are basically independent organizations. However, this problem they're trying to solve with moving to a more friendlier tax culture. And, well, well, you know, like the, the, the businesses that, that put an empty office in Ireland with nobody in it to have an address so they can get taxed at a 3% property tax. Apple? Yeah. yeah. Water. So we come up with, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give a 20% tax rate to repatriate that money and 15% for assets. And I sit there, and what does China do when they see that? They lower the corporate tax rate. What if everybody starts lowering the corporate, even lower? You know how I'm going to handle that? Okay, guys, here's the deal. For six months, you got a tax holiday providing one of two things. 80% of the money goes for CapEx investment. You're buying machines. You're, buy you're expanding your factories. Or you're hiring so many people. And once the six months are over, forget it. That money would pump in here, and maybe there'd be some justification to the Dow Jones. But think about it. They would be forced to put it to work. Yeah. No, you know what these guys are going to do, the ones who do save it? You know what they're going to do? They're going to buy back their own stock. Yeah. They're going to increase their dividends. They're going to line their own pockets. There were no stipulations on what you must do to repatriate that money. And that's wrong. And if you really look at some of these breakdowns, there are companies that have it structured where it's moving through so many countries that by the time it's said and done, they're paying less than a percentage point of taxes. And you know what? They can afford the lawyers, they can afford the accountants, <coughs> and the bankers will say, you want to keep moving money, don't worry about it. Because it stops here for a few days, we don't want it. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering, did you read this uh, article they had in the Washington Post about two months ago? The president of Emerson, Emerson Electronics, said he and three other corporations have got orders for automated equipment. He said it's a, it's a, a joke when uh, these corporate officials are supposedly going to give their employees a trillion dollar pay raise. Well. I'm going to tell you something. You know what the big joke is? In my mind, 
And I'm going to be honest about my political view. If you ask me my political party, I'm going to tell you, I'm disgusted. <laughs> Both sides are lazy, self-consumed liars. <laughs> Right, left, look, all that's different is they wear a different costume to the party. One wears a donkey, one wears an elephant. They're all getting rich. Ask me how many congressmen on both sides of the aisle are not millionaires. I think the poorest guy is worth 10 million. But the biggest joke, I think, on the American people, and boy, this is going on YouTube. I might get audited on this one. That's okay. I want to bring the jobs back. <laughs> yeah, good luck on that. He's got a fantasy that we're going to bring back a manufacturing economy from 20 years ago because these companies want to come back. It's not going to happen. They'll come back, but it'll be all robotics. <laughs> okay, I brought the company back. They invested $10 billion. Sure did. Look at those robots go. Meanwhile, the people in Paducah, Kentucky still aren't working. But they came to the rally. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, I don't know, I'm out of work myself. I mean, how can we have a, how can you have a country with robotics and nobody working? I mean, that doesn't mean, I mean, if people don't have money, they can't buy consumer goods, it's going to pull the whole thing down. That's when, when, when we go below that equilibrium point where they can't find enough people with money. They're going to figure out we got to do something here. Because if people don't buy the goods, as you said, it doesn't matter what's making them. What do you think is going to happen with that equilibrium when that equilibrium point's reached? Well, I think we've started to see what's going on. I mean, we're starting to see the inklings of civil unrest. We're starting to see it. You know what I mean? And, People, are, <coughs> people can only take things for so long. Yes, sir. Yeah, a tr a truck drivers, truck drivers used to be a good job, good pain, but now they're having a hard time making a living. Right. What happened? A couple things. Number one is the safety. And I have a, I have a good friend who owns a truck. Yeah. It is impossible for him to find drivers clean enough for the insurance companies to say he can work here. So there's a shortage of drivers, number one. Number two, the long haul trucker doesn't really exist like it used to. A lot of these guys are sleeping in their own bed every night and they're going 200 miles a day out and 200 in, the way this is set up. The expansion of the intermodal network, of the trains carrying the intermodal containers, the trucks picking them up, has really, really, really curtailed the amount of over-the-road trucking. Plus the fact is, if you look at the footprint of a company like Walmart, Walmart's designed its distribution centers where they're all within like a day's drive. So as these networks like web through the country, it takes away the big money over-the-road trucking and it reduces it to short-haul intermodal. Yes, sir. Is that what happened to all those big truck companies like Pacific, Intermountain Express, and Consolidated Freight? That's why you saw the the uh, compression, and now you have what uh, Old Dominion is one. You have just a few main players, but there used to be so many more names on the road. There was a compression in the industry. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, sir. What, um, are you uh, tuned in to any of the, the hopeful signs happening around the country that things can get better now that now that the country is generally waking up with as Trump stuck a finger in their eye? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, we do have a lot, a lot to be optimistic about. But I have a good friend who is fifth generation manufacturing of a heavy material, steel. And he said something to me the other day. He said, you know what? We don't make much anymore as a country. 
we don't make the amount of products we eat, and we have to get used to making things. Now, yes, are we optimistic about our technology and about our bioscience and about all these other great things? Yes. But you know what? I'm not going to get optimistic until we get some grown-ups in the house in Washington. <laughs> I mean, come on. I, 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 as again, as I told you, I, I don't have any affiliation. But to hear the Democrats say on TV today, we didn't get to read the bill. Well, didn't get to read the tax bill. Well, guess what? Paybacks are a bitch. I seem to remember about four years ago, if you want to read it, you've got to pass it. And who am I quoting there? I'm quoting somebody just as crazy on the other side. They're, right, they're the same. This isn't the way our forefathers designed this thing to work. God, a senator was the, the position in the Senate was a part-time job for farmers and doctors who were only supposed to come in a few times. And now it's become a way to major wealth. And everybody else suffers. It sucks. Okay. Uh, right, do we have any more questions? Yeah. Let's welcome our speaker and his question. Our speaker again, and uh, we'll sit down and uh, listen to some of our rebuttals, and then he'll get the last word here. Uh, so uh, we'll head toward rebuttal time. Uh, we'll do something different tonight. Uh, hold up your hand. Anybody that wants to give a rebuttal, I'm going to hand out cards with numbers on them, so you don't have 10 people coming up here later when we're running out of time. So if you want to do a rebuttal, uh, I'll come by and give you a card. Hold up your hand. Okay. No, it doesn't need any order. Just, just we're just trying to get at We got plenty of time. No. We'll have plenty of time. All right. You guys have this guy on here. <laughs> this is where I get beat up. Well, no, really. Some of them will be in here. I'll go first. While Andy is rebutting, I'll go first. Okay. Let us thank our speaker one more time. Yeah. Hey, he went with our number. He got no number. <laughs> We're going to do a four-minute deal, each of us. I'm going to go first. Our speaker tonight has been very much involved. I remember myself, I started uh, delivering in 1988, after, shortly after I was out of the service. I just started delivering pizzas for a living, you know. You'd get the little money here and there, and, you know, next thing you know, you'd be working eight, ten hours extra after your full-time job. Money sometimes can be pretty good, but boy, you could wear out a car fast. I remember my first couple of days. I was delivering in my own hometown, which I thought I knew. And you know what? The next day was a Saturday. I found myself at the public library looking over zoning maps for about eight hours trying to figure out what the heck did I sign up for. I then remember going to the village hall on a Monday morning and getting a six foot by eight foot zoning map put up on the pizza place wall and learning how they had the address system in Algonquin. It wasn't Main and the Main Street and another cross street. It was Main Street and the river that went through town. There was a county grid. There was a specific municipal grid, too, as well. As a matter of fact, I finally figured out why one street in the Algonquin area had three different sets of numbers on it. And I was able to answer it. It was because it was annexed by one town, the other address was grandfathered in, and as it changed, it had changed over ownership between the two villages in the county six times in the last 20 years. And I remember one time I was at a place, he says, you know why the addresses are all different? I said, yeah. He says, come on in. I got a $10 tip out of that deal. The other good trick I learned was 
dress up as Santa Claus during delivery times at Christmas time. Huh. They almost always got a hug from the kids and a kiss from the and a kiss from the ladies. <laughs> Which you know uh, you play it up by by the mom kiss Santa Claus. But I do remember there were nights that I made 150 bucks cash. But then I'd also be burning 200 miles on my vehicle. You know, I knew Uber and the rideshare was a little bit of the same thing. You'd, pr you'd probably make 200 bucks in a couple of days' work, but you'd be out there all the time. I have a good friend of mine. Many of you know him as Paul Racino. And he does a lot of the gig economy work because he works through websites and various other places. And he's always on the web, always arguing, you know, arguing with somebody about the rate of pay, about being short or being even overpaid for something. And it's like, it's like in some cases, he, there's more work involved with having a subcontractor to a subcontractor than there is if they just hire him outright. I. I'm generally optimistic about our economy because, you know, much as uh, much as the there's an economist up there, Johann Norberg, who's basically described something that many of us tend to forget. We're actually living longer. We're having much better quality of life over time. We still have a long way to go before we all reach a certain level. And as after 9-11, the United States kind of focused inward until about maybe 2012, two more, United, the equivalent of two more United States came online. And Trump, while he's in office, wondering how to make America great again, China is sitting there back quietly. And you remember this from, one belt, from our Chinese ambassador. They have a program called the One Belt, One Road, which means uh, Truckload of laptops can be, can, can be can made up in Shenzhen, and a week later, be ready for distribution in the department stores in London. That requires upper and railroads, more infrastructure and, and jobs, and it may just mean that finally the Central Asian Republic is going. Now again, you know, I know we're having climate change, I know we're having energy problems, and I've spoken before on the recent developments in the Generation 4 nuclear reactor, specifically the thorium molten salt reactor. I am very sold on that technology to help us out to keep centralized power coming to the U.S. And what many people don't realize is that these Uber companies do have infrastructure. They do have things that require engineering. And that's all done by the local phone companies. You have the fiber optic cables, you have the data center warehouses, you have Tons and tons of things. As a matter of fact, in most of rural America right now, particularly in like Utah and some other places, data centers go up like crazy. Data warehouses go up like crazy, all to service this new economy. I've had my say. Thank you again for a good speech. Right up, You're going to wait for total rebuttals and then get the last word. Okay. Please. Uh, you will get plenty of time tonight. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I will say simply this. I wasn't until very recently optimistic about the future. I was optimistic, and I want to take this opportunity to thank our speaker for a very good statement. Thank you. Thank you. I learned a lot. Thank you. 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 I wasn't optimistic about the future until the elections of last month. Winston Churchill summed it up best after the Battle of Alamein. Uh, when he was addressing the crowd at the Mansion House in London, the president of the Lord Mayor. This is not the, the, the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. But it is perhaps the end of the beginning. <laughs> um, comments were made about, the, about Rahm Emanuel and, his, and the fact that he's let uh, Uber would, or whoever it is get in here and have so much clout. And I don't defend what he's doing. But you act all act as if this were something new. When I was a kid, I'm going to be 64 next spring. In those days, there wasn't any Lyft or Uber. There were a whole bunch of cab companies with Yellow and Checker being by far the two biggest ones. And the cab drivers were not in those days independent contractors. They worked for the cab companies. 
And the medallions were owned by yellow and checkered by some independents. And there was a family by the name of Merkin who owned yellow and checker here in Chicago. The rights to the yellow and checker names across the rest of the country, they franchised out the names in the rest of the country. <coughs> they owned Checker Motors, the company that built the cabs. And they also owned Continental Air Transport, the airport bus line between uh, downtown Chicago and the airports. So uh, they had considerable clout with the elder mayor Daly in City Hall. And they had considerable control over uh, who, they, who they let use their medallions. So, if anything, I think things were probably worse back then. <laughs> so, President Truman used to point out that there is nothing new under the sun. It's all been done before. And there's a certain amount of truth to that. Thank you. Who's next? Come on up, Charlie. I got to redeem my number. Oh, yeah. I got a receipt. Yeah. Bring us coffee. Apparently, nobody wants to give us a rebuttal tonight. Yeah, they get it in them. First of all, let's thank our speaker. We're covered a lot of area here. Okay, I'll be quick because you shall cover different areas. I'm still writing it, but I got a lucky number here, so I already come up with it. Anyhow, um, thinking first of all from the world of work, how you're talking about how things has cha have changed. Um, when I started the traditional workplace, uh, you had an eight. You began at eight o'clock or nine o'clock, um, and you had a fixed time and you generally were assigned to a desk and people had, we had issues like tardiness and things like that and over the years I've negotiated these we began, we had began something called flexi tour came in meaning you could start any time between oh there was flexi tour and flexi time but basically you could start any time between let's say between seven and nine. You could come in at a different time every day and leave eight and a half hours later. And their flexi tour so came in of variations. And then, uh, yeah, flexi tour came in. There were other things like five, four, nine, and four, 12, um, not four, 12, four, 10. Um, different different <laughs> schedules, like you have one day off every two weeks and you work nine hour days. So all kinds of experimentation came in. Uh, until today, the latest manifestation is that the contemporary office, uh, no one has a desk assigned to them. If you are coming in, you can reserve a workstation, make certain they're available, and it's just a little spot about as big as this podium, and you bring your laptop with you, and that's your desk for the day. And there are no phones, there are no such things as a desk phone. Everybody has their own phone with them, and if you have to have a meeting of any type, there are a certain number of small little conference rooms, or different sizes actually, and you can go to this service and see what's available and rent one of those, or claim one of those conference rooms for the course of the day. That's called hoteling, and that's the work of the future. When I go in, I still have a regular office, but when I go in, and want to see some of the officers of the union. Uh, I often don't know their schedules or they don't have permanent schedules. So I have to inquire who's going to be in the office on this, like next week I have to find out when and where they're going to be in the office next week. So uh, things like that. Yeah, the other thing is um, independent contractors 
a terrible began with the information business. And instead of hiring people to work on a staff and giving them permanent assignments as the techie to keep all the computers running and what have you, they decided for some reason, and I think the industry is largely responsible for this, they began offering their services on a contract basis annually or on a per diem or per hour basis like your pal does. So they've created their own environment and yes there's no paid benefits and the perfect situation for the employer because if for any reason uh, you, you do not perform to their likely the way they like uh, they can terminate you, they're not subject to any labor laws whatsoever, they have no obligation for uh, even things on the job injury, uh, vacations, air illness, or uh, fixed annuity in the event you should get old after working for them for 40 or 50 years. So this is what capitalism has achieved. Um, these independent contractors, um, no, I don't think they're going to replace public transit. I don't perceive there being fleets of them, as you may perceive. I have given a lecture here on transportation of the future, and it's not to provide independent, independent vehicles. That only works on a very limited basis, um, in some cases. And very, it really doesn't. The concept of a public vehicle, which arrived, a major thing is on a very fixed and dependable schedule, is probably where people are going to end up with some other variables here. But according to this, uh, the technology, I guess, is telling me that I got to go. Anyhow, I was, oh, the other thing I was going to mention, Tim. Um, you mentioned Libertarians that on March we're going to have the Libertarian candidate for the governor of the state of Illinois. So, hope to see you on March and thank you again very much. All right. Well, let's see, I follow the rules here. I think I did all right. I wasn't ready. But I mean, how many people vote for that? It's in the ballot in 50 states. Okay. Our resident, uh, our resident Sox fan. Boo! Boo! Yeah. What's with the hate for the White Sox? Uh, we're, they're, they're not winners, though. We're just giving you yeah, grief. We're giving you grief, that's why. We waited 200 years for a champion. We did it first. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, each team, each team has a chance. Um, yeah. And they only lost one game. They didn't score a game. Uh, yes, there's right, a South Side. There were <laughs> solid games, and they were done on the bus and on the yeah. way home. <laughs> they didn't need to read the way. Four days, all it took. <laughs> I liked the near South Side. I was driving around. It was very gritty, a lot of infrastructure. I like the near sort of South Side more than, you know, this uh, yeah, I, stock I, rollers. Yeah, yeah I, like, I like living in grit. <laughs> Yeah, it's show not gentrified, <laughs> uh, original architecture, infrastructure. <laughs> you know, uh, so all right, so we're talking about Uber and we're talking about Uber. We're talking about Uber, we're talking about the uh, stock market. Okay, everybody knows I hate Uber and for CTA. You know, what? You know, Chicago used to have a lot of cab drivers get, get a bullet in the head. You know, when it happened by Salzer Library, uh, some knucklehead killed a, a, a cab driver or an Uber driver. So Uber probably don't care about that. <laughs> you know, some some crazy person with a gun comes in and shoots, blows somebody's head, uh, Uber driver's head off. Uber just says that well, it's part of the you know, just part of our Wall Street situation. Our yeah. Plan. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Uber's bad for the CTA, Uber's bad for us bikers, Uber's bad for transportation, and more road, more, more congestion, more people on the roads, more dangerous driving, more um, pollution, all that good stuff, more oil use, so you know, you can take Uber and stick it. Um, 
Now, as far as Wall Street and the big board, they call the big board. I went to college for, I was supposed to be a stockbroker, but I couldn't handle it. You know, Where did he go wrong? Right, yeah. I know. <laughs> when I went got on the college, the big board was at a thousand, not going anywhere fast. <laughs> and plus, I got sick and tired of watching CRT screens going up by an eighth of a dollar and down. Screw that. So I went to the real economy, which didn't really work out too well after 30 years. I should have been in this scam casino economy. All right, here real quick, here's who the original Dow Jones Industrial Average companies were Thank you. in 1896. You guys see that on the news every day, right? 24,000 now, all the one percenters are making. Who thinks the Dow Jones Industrial Average is a, an indicator of the economy? It's an indicator of 30 stuff. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the economy. It is, you know, it's, it's speculators and 1% stock values. That's all that is. It's not, a, it's not a real good indicator of the economy. There's other things that are more important, like uh, wages uh, and other things like that, and you know, uh, life, uh, value of life and things like that. Anyway, so back, back in the day, the only original company from the first uh, Dow Jones, who, who knows what that is? Of the 30. There's only one company. It's been gerrymandered over the year to years to have more successful, growing company. Not 18 T. Anybody got a guess? What's an original uh, Dow Jones? Huh? Close. Ford's. They're not even in nowadays. They're not even in the 30. The Dow Jones. The only original from the original Dow Jones from 1896 is GE. Oh, they're on the They're starting this. Yeah, they're going to get replaced by um, Amazon probably. So, see, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Lab is also a marketing tool because they get they know they get the, the blast that over the airwaves every day. There's prestige to being. Well, and plus it's a way for people to go, oh my God, I should be throwing my, shoveling my money and life earnings into the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And you don't know anything about Wall Street. I got a freaking college degree in economics and finance. Okay, I'll show you the sheepskin. Okay, the other companies were American Cotton Oil, which is now Best Foods. American Sugar, this is from 1896. American Sugar, which is now Amstar, American Tobacco, which was broken up. <laughs> uh, Chicago Gas Company, which is now People's Energy, was an original. People's was one of the original Dow Jones companies. Time's up. Time's up. I get more, because there's not that many speakers, I get more time. Who says? <laughs> That's five minutes? I don't talk for five minutes. Yeah, you did. Go to Toastmasters. I got a question for you. Well, okay, we got a question in back by somebody. Yeah, yeah who is that back there? I got a bill and I, I called him up. I said, why why do I have to, if it's the people's gas, why do I have to pay for it? <laughs> if what? If it's the people's gas, <laughs> why do we have to pay for it? Is that the punchline or the joke or both? Both. 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 I just wanted to see if you guys were paying attention. We're paying attention. Yeah, All right, paying time attention. is up. If you guys ever want. <laughs> I say when my time's up. If you ever want to go and see what go the real to story masters. get off the stage. Is uh, about <laughs> the Wall Street scam. Give him a hook. Go to Mother Jones, January 2010. It shows you one last thing. How we printed 14 trillion dollars for Wall Street in the bailout after the Wall Street crash. Bye -bye. Mother Jones. Bye bye. 15 trillion. Kurt, clap them all. Uh -oh. You don't get to keep the set down, me, you're up here. You can't trust the big <laughs> You can trust independence. Uh, All right, thank you. Why don't you somebody call me a biotic photo? I'm not into politics. Here. I went to Rosie and Ann. Yeah. 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 Now, here, you want to see something? Here's a picture. God does not have hands. Yeah. 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 God does not have hands. And angels do not have wings. Um, and angels' theme song is I ain't got no body. 
And um, so it's your the biggest problem in the world right now, I can imagine, is North Korea. <laughs> that little squares in North Korea, he's a nihilist, nihilist, like atheist. He, he blow up the world, he doesn't care. Just like uh, Richard, uh, uh, Christopher Hutchins and the other guy. And uh, 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 last week I made a suggestion that would make get a suggestion box. And today I'd like to make a suggestion that <clears throat> The uh, bulletin or the, uh, should be on the 8 and a half by 11. And on the other side, it's blank. Because I found it. That's the way it was when I started about 30. In fact, last week was the 32nd anniversary I was here. And uh, if I found that a couple years later on the other side, uh, it was blank and I had some notes there. So we should use these, these uh, the directory or the... Uh, for a blank on the other side for uh, notes. Are you going to pay for that paper bill? Oh, okay. Uh, Just use your you now, uh, Richard Hutchins, uh, Christopher Hutchins says that uh, God, uh, God, uh, it, it, the idea of God is a delusion, an illusion. I think that for uh, atheists, they think that everything started with the Big Bang. That's an illusion. There was, before the Big Bang, what caused the Big Bang? And, uh, Let's see, I got it in a letter. Okay, the word like college of complexes. The word complex and simplex is the same word. It's C-O-M, that's uh, from the Latin, and S-Y-N, that's from the Greek, means together. And uh, plex means bent, bent together. Somebody says complex or simplex, it's bent together. Is that anything and, that and the word college, how many here know the word, what the word college means? This is a college of complexes or com college of simplexes. Yeah, everybody knows what the word co college means? It comes from two Latin words to uh, read together. And in, 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 in college you read. You go to college not to learn, but you learn. You go to college to learn how to learn. And uh, now Richard Dawkins, or uh, Christopher Dawkins, no, Richard Dawkins, he uh, said that it's an illusion. And uh, because he, okay, it's uh, it's noon time. At midnight, that does, uh, okay, at midnight there is no sun. Does he believe that the sun exists today? Of course he does. And so uh, at noon time there is no sun. At midnight, there is no sun. Does that say that the sun of S U N of God and S O N? So it, 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 it's a delusion, delusion by saying that there is no God. The heavens, uh, the universe, <laughs> the heavens proclaim the glory of God. Where did it, 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 came, it all came from the Big Bang. Now they're talking about multi universes and omniverse. What is this supposed to be this about? Is no this is about <laughs> not politics. None, that's not my forte. About religion and uh, sports. Now, in, in North Korea, years, several years ago, this year, uh, Rodman uh, was out there in the little squirt in North Korea. He was infatuated with uh, Rodman, the basketball guy. He sent him out there, maybe he forget about these intercontinental missiles and concentrate on, on uh, basketball. And I even told you that a couple of months back. In other, uh, okay, yes, today, uh, how many years back? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, at the University of Chicago, the atomic, um, the, under the tennis court, they had a, uh, the chain reaction of a bomb. It was uh, 58 years ago, 59 years ago in 58 where the uh, first atomic bomb was uh, <laughs> blown up there under, under the uh, tennis court. The fire, right, but 75 and, years ago. and also, <clears throat> yesterday was uh, in Chicago, the 92 uh, children were, uh, were burned to death over in that lady of angels and three nuns. Yeah. And today also, uh, in, uh, in 1980, there were four nuns were slaughtered. Uh, they, were, they were raped, slaughtered, and Burnt and they buried over in, the, in San Salvador. This is uh, get the Richard Dawkins. Uh, Richard Dinkins. 
Christopher Dawkins here. Yeah. How much would it cost to have Richard Dawkins come here? How many thousands of bucks? It's time so out of here. He says that the, your time the God is, is an illusion. Time's up. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's not get rowdy here. Let's, let's okay. Then, I, I, you, you guys get the education here today, too, but simplex and complex is the same word. Yeah. And word college, and you read together. Legendary. Something legible is a readable. Uh, what does it mean you're done? What does it mean to go to college? You go to college to learn how to learn. And I hope you learned something today. And also, Charlie, this is the, uh, uh, <clears throat> you got those numbers jazzed up here. Sure. According to the numbers, these, these uh, conferences, it's yeah, 69 years. Nice we were it, 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 60, six years and 11 months. Come January 6th, it will be 67 year, years. And you're still Get the numbers straight. And and what are we supposed to be, remember today here? I forget what number it is. 30, 3346. What did you learn today? How about the, how, how, how a bad, how okay. a guy Okay, you learned bad. today, uh, life is, uh, oh, oh. Uh, life, life is hard by the yard, but a cinch by the inch. On the 33rd, 34th, 33rd, 46th day, say you learned Your time life is hard up. by the yard, but a Your cinch by the inch. Up. Your time what do you is say? Up. Life, check, Charlie. Life is hard by the yard, but a cinch by the inch. Yeah, Period. I think your time's up. <laughs> and God does not have any hands, the angel does not have wings. We know that. Your time's up. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Our next speaker, please. Is there another one? Yeah. We have a coherent speaker. Yes. Coherent, yeah. You learned awful lot today, Charlie. I'm going to get the right up the paper yeah, here. Right. You learned today. How the height of light is hard by the yard and the cinch by the inch. How did you get around? We see the crowd's about half the size as it was uh, at the start tonight. So there's a lot of people don't want to stick around to hear the final thoughts of our speaker, and it would be nice if they did. But um, for what we have, I, I would like to thank our speaker tonight, Patrick for a really coherent presentation about oh, yeah. what's, what's happening in and around Chicago and we'll just give it a minute here. All right, Andy. We, we all back. Um, as you can see from the audience, and uh, I imagine you uh, found in driving that you saw a wide range of people. I've been giving speeches here for 10 years uh, centered around a, a book called Project Censored, Censored News out of Sonoma State. It's a journalism school. They publish a book with the top 25 blacked out stories every year that would change the country overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. And as you're driving around and interacting with the general population, you, you see examples of what Project Censored called people living in a bubble of media-generated mythology. The job of the media in America is to maintain a bubble over this country and keep as many people in the bubble as they can, believing things that aren't real, aren't true, and aren't correct. We keep hearing daily uh, people referring to Donald Trump as President Trump. Well, he's not the president. He was never elected. He's a corporate criminal. He's the most singularly unqualified person ever to masquerade as a president. And that's going a long way after George W. Bush. He's almost making George look good. And George masqueraded the job for eight years. We have a huge political bubble, a charade going on in this country. And people are waking up. And uh, Tuesday, who is it? Uh, David said uh, a vote a couple Tuesdays ago, a whole bunch of disgusted people that rose up as progressives got elected. If you show up and vote and run, uh, you can displace some of these corporate criminals. And that's what's happening all over the country. But language matters. To keep referring to Donald Trump as President Trump hides the fact that he's the most singly corrosive, slimy individual ever to masquerade as our president. And that's the kindest thing that can be said about it. Yeah. Wait, you just log on to some of the websites and see some of the uncredibles. Don't hold back. But, uh, yeah, the, 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 I was looking at Greg Powell's site. You know, there's, there's so much. 
so much going on. The news media doesn't report good news. They report only basically bad news. On a, on a planet of six billion people, somebody's getting shot or killed every day. The media is if they're camping down and find that person. It's on the news. All, up, updated 7-Eleven robberies all day long, whatever it is. There's no time to tell us that there's energy sources that are not coal, oil, gas, or nuclear. Uh, Union of Concerned Scientists just put out a report saying uh, solar energy now is cheaper than fossil fuel anywhere in the world. Uh, solar electricity is cheaper in 57 cities in this country than buying electricity from the local utility. Seventh graders know the future belongs to solar and wind power. Uh, a lot of doctors around the world, I've been reporting this for 10 years, I've been reading about it for 25, Many, many doctors around the world have been reporting that the AIDS epidemic is over and that it wasn't caused by HIV. When people first find out that HIV is harmless, they can't believe it. But it takes a while for information to come up through lawsuits in America like it did against asbestos and tobacco. So the future is a lot brighter for kids growing up today. They're not growing up under a big AIDS epidemic. 10,000 times more energy falls on us every day in light than what we need. We, we collect a percentage of the solar. We don't need fossil fuel. But what we have to do, we have to stop talking about these billionaire predators as capitalists that just made their money uh, working hard. Nobody makes $5 billion by working hard. You get $5 billion by a system that steals from 10, 20, 50,000 poor people and it eliminates the middle class. And this is what uh, Greg Palace's book in the movie you can watch too, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. We have in America, our Congress right now as it stands with the Supreme Court ruling unlimited money contributions, our Congress is the finest, smoothest running, best financed intellectual whorehouse on the planet. It's a whorehouse. Look it up in the dictionary. There's two definitions. One is selling sex, and the other one is selling your vote for a certain amount of money. And this is, you can't, if you're not an uh, intellectual prostitute, you can't get elected as a Republican almost anywhere in this country. The billionaires tell you what they want done. You all saw that on news last week. The billionaires put out a word to the politicians, and, uh, and one guy reported, he says, uh, I've got to pass, we have to pass this tax law, we won't get any contributions for election next year. The, 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 the owners of these people said, get it done or we're not giving you any more money. There's no more any charade about our political system serving America. And this is where we are. They just serve Wall Street. They serve oh, Wall Street. Yeah. So it's, it's, we have to step through the bubble and once we learn something, you know, other people learn. Things get better when people move forward. That's all I, all I have to say. So again, thank you. And uh, we'll see you next week. Good luck. Uh, any, are there any other uh, people that would like to give a rebuttal? We still have a little time. Otherwise, the speaker will get the last word and we'll head out early. No, you already had one. Peter. Oh, should I speak? Go ahead. You want go ahead. to give a rebuttal? Take four minutes, Peter. Go ahead. Go ahead, Peter. As long as you're not a banker. Go ahead. Say whatever you want to say. Say whatever you want to say, Peter. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not done treasure. Our speaker. Uh, tonight our speaker made some valid points about uh, the robotic impacts and job losses. Uh, and uh, let's see, I guess, I guess in the, for many years there was the American middle class and now it's just disappearing and that's not right. I mean, well it's not right to just have a limited number of people rich and most are poor, that's not right. I mean, this country, you know, is supposed to be middle, uh, middle class country. It's supposed to be an example of the world. You know, I guess right now, I guess the way things are now, I don't think we're doing a great job of that. So, so I thank the speaker for his thought. Alright, yeah. All right, I'm back again and I'm not going to be nice. Yeah, the, the NBA guy. <laughs> the NBA guy. Oh, yeah. Why are you doing a second rebuttal? Because I didn't get the finish, you guys cut me off. I haven't done my Sean Spicer invitation in a while. It's been nice to you guys. All right. I'm not done trashing Wall Street. All right. So these suckers, you know what that guy is? That's a monopoly man. Yeah. That's yeah. what we're in. A, we're back into the Gilded Age. You betcha. Okay. My point is about the Dow Jones Industrial uh, Average and 
Wall Street. Whatever, whatever's good for them is bad for us. Lower taxes on the rich. Good for you? No. Good for Wall Street. Bad wages. Seven dollars an hour. Good for you, everybody? No. But great for Wall Street. Less protections, regulations, uh, subsidies to help poor elderly environment. Good for you, yes. Bad for Wall Street. Safety nets, good for you, bad for Wall Street. Monopolies, great for Wall Street. Globalization, great for Wall Street. Puts pressure on wages here. Union, non-unionization. Huh? Good for us because of competition. What, monopolies? No, globalization. globalization. <coughs> You're it puts wrong. pressure on wages in this country. Yeah. That's because you don't have enough capitalism, my friend. You need more capitalism to get rid of the monopolistic people in Wall Street. That's yeah. why you need more stock exchanges around the world, such as Beijing, such as London, such as other stock exchanges, to bring some competition to these guys. Oh, get I'm just out listening. Of here. Oh, you are. <laughs> You don't like All right. <laughs> Automation, computerization. I mean, some of this stuff's un unavoidable. Globalization. <laughs> Good for Wall Street, bad for the public. Mergers and ac ac acquisitions, otherwise known as known as murders and executions. <laughs> <laughs> bad, great for Wall Street. Some mergers are incredibly great for people. Uh, How? And terrible. How? It could Thousands speak. lose their jobs. Yeah, but, like but wait a second. If a company's going over, going under, and it merges with a company that can keep it under, you might keep a thousand jobs in that region that might not. But it's never that. a company. You can't paint it's, this with it's a broad never, brush. It's never a company going under. It's, uh, it's called economies of scale, as they taught me in 102 or 101. Well, or yeah. 301 economics. You probably took that too. Yeah, and I know a lot when about When you hear economies, economies of scale, scale you don't want to go down monopoly. that road. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to go down it that means road. It means monopolies. Okay, don't heckle the speaker. Oh. No heckle. No, no, the speaker. We can heckle. looking heckle. forward to reporting this one. No, so, I'm whenever you hear scale or economies of scale, that means a monopoly and it's bad for employees and bad for the economy. Not really. Monopolies are the worst thing possible for the public and for business and for the economy. And our microphone. And I'm done trashing Wall Street. Yeah, you're monopolizing our microphone. All right. All right. Wait a minute. He's going to come on. Come on, man. I'm forgetting oh, what yeah, the first guy that. said. No, 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 no. I'll be very quick. Uh, I didn't get to summarize it, but clearly the delineation tonight's topic, if I could define it, is that we get two different trends in the world of work or occupations. Traditionally, traditional banking is the most conservative and rule following there could be. I still recollect my friend okay. who worked downtown in the bank and was called into the office, yeah. as we used to say in the railroad on the carpet, and he was informed that uh, at his bank, even though he wore sports coats uh, to work very nice and conservative, he was expected to wear a suit. Now, the other ch real change is, um, we used to joke, the, uh, they had an employee and the boss got fed up, this was an actual case, the boss got fed up with them, they had some issue, something, you know, pumps wouldn't work, and the boss said, he said, get this, get out of here, get out of the way, I'll take over, I'll do this. And the boy says, what should I do? He says, I don't, I don't dare. Just go, go away, go home. I'll call you when I need you. So the employee did. And he went home. And then they had to go looking for him. But the point I'm making is, the employee of today is in the same status. They'll call you when they need you. And that's exactly what they want. They'll pay you only as much as they have to. And no more, no less. So that's the real change here. And you got to watch out for that. They'll call you when I need you. And it's at their convenience. Bring you know, back the they're unions. controlling the clock. What do you got to say anyway? What? Bring back the unions. Yeah, you're right. All right, I'm with you. All right. All right.
right, it's all you. Oh, where's yeah. Tim? Okay, I mean, I need to. Tim, Tim Fickhouse, he's out there having a suck fest he, on a week. He's burning one. Yeah, he's yeah, burning he one, so he's going to suck on some nicotine. He'll be so back in just a minute. Okay, well, okay. first of all, thank you. Boy, there is a lot, lot to come back at here. This yeah, is, we don't mess around. No, you <laughs> don't. Politics here, right? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> and I'm either. You guys are going to say to me, well, you know, he's got guts. I don't agree with him, but don't have him back. But no, no we want to check, check your fit check and come back. Um, first of all, again, this exchange of ideas and different points of views is just absolutely refreshing. Sure, wish the Congress and Senate could do it, but what are we asking for, you know? Um, I agree with the gentleman who said that that wasn't a nice thing to say about Ron Emanuel because there were corrupt administrations prior to him. But I grew up with a very guilt-driven Italian mother who always told me two wrongs never make a right. Meaning, if we are ever going to get that pure change and move to quality governance, wouldn't it be great if just once somebody got in who didn't have their thumb somewhere? Not saying that Ron's <laughs> thumb is as big as the Daly family. God forbid. I mean, so, that being said, I also do want to say something. You mentioned that Uber has assets with infrastructure and networks. Uber pays for the infrastructure that this country built for. They're using the existing phone lines and satellite hookups and and the like. And they're renting space in data centers. By the way, don't invest in a data center. They're getting smaller by the day. I ran a data center for four years. Really? I mean, oh yeah, they're getting smaller by the day. Now I'm going to go somewhere where, boy, if you would ask me 20 minutes ago I was going to go here, I would have said, no way am I going here. <laughs> Is anybody here? gone to the hospital or had a loved one go in and have a critical MRI done, mm -hmm. a yes. critical procedure with an advanced piece of equipment, mm -hmm. thank an investment banker or a stockbroker. Uh -huh. You go home at night and turn the lights on, mm -hmm. thank an investment banker, thank a stockbroker. Right. Uh -huh. You know what, right. if you get can't, yeah, and you know what? Yeah, I, I used to manage money for milk and ice cream drivers, for grave diggers. And let me tell you something. I've known some real scum on Wall Street, but I've also known some real scum in labor unions. <laughs> it's the normal distribution of mankind. It hits every industry. And if we don't quit attacking everything in this country with a broad brush, we're not going to go forward. There are good doctors. There are great doctors. There are scum doctors. There are great union advocates and there are just absolute opportunists. There are brilliant financiers who try and make this country a better place. And then there are scumbags just looking for a fee. We cannot look at everything from one prism. That is what's killing this country. We are getting divided in every which way on Sunday. Black, white, rich, poor. Muslim, Christian, and that is by design, because this country has proven over 200 plus years that when we are united, we are unbeatable, but when we are divided, we are nothing. And you ask me about my optimism. I'm going to quote a man, a highly educated man, who died with a nickel in his pocket. But he died with credibility and self-respect. And he taught me how to look at adversity when the world was looking ugly. And that man was my father. In the 20s, it was the Depression. In the late 30s, it was Hitler. In the 40s, it was Hitler in Japan. In the 50s, it was Korea, and then it was Russia. In the 70s, it was Vietnam. And every time there was inflation or economic slowdown, it was the end of this country. No way, man. 
No way. The people are figuring it out. They're figuring it out. And I don't know how it's going to happen or where it will happen. But if I were buying a stock, I'd buy it on this country. Because this is the greatest country in the world. And as bad as we have it, my heart goes out for this man. He's unemployed. I had eight years of prolonged unemployment. Eight. It sucks. It sucks. But you know what? We still live a lifestyle better than 99% of the rest of the world. And they, hang, they hold us in contempt because we have things so damn good. So something's working here. But don't let them divide us. I, I really, really enjoyed every man in this room tonight. From my buddy who hates, who hates Wall Street, I love his passion, I love his research. No, no, but you are what this country's about. The gentleman back there is what this country's about. We're a lot, no, no. What people aren't getting today is, what people have died for, and given so much for is so we all can carry our own opinion. Doesn't mean you have to agree with me, but it doesn't mean I have to despise you because you don't agree with me. And if we don't get past that, North Korea is not our problem. We are. I want to thank you guys. It was a gas. Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. Again, give our speaker a hand for a really coherent presentation. Thank you so much for the trip out here. We look forward to having you speak again if you want to talk on the same Anybody or a different wants topic. A copy of the book there are books for sale up here. He's got a copy of his book. There's a few left. If anybody wants one, they're like $13, $12.95. It looks like an interesting book.